Good evening. Would you stand with us tonight? I'll tell you what, she could just keep on preaching that sermon she was preaching this morning as far as I'm concerned. As I was thinking today, God's going to have a people that's going to have a revival that's willing to go get the presence of the Lord and bring it. But there's also going to be a group of people that's going to look through the window and criticize. I'll never forget years and years ago when they were having the revival in Pensacola. And there's the people around and was talking. And to be honest with you, I didn't have no opinion because I hadn't been to Pensacola. But some of the people there, they, man, they were just talking so bad about the revival in Pensacola. And I'm thinking, why? Why? They were looking through the window. They weren't there. When you experience the presence of God, when you're in love with Jesus, you're not interested in criticizing people. You're interested in lifting up Jesus Christ. Now, let's just start this service tonight with worship. Lord, we just worship you tonight. Lord, you're worthy to be praised. I just speak in the name of Jesus. Lord, that your presence would be here in such a special way. Let your people, Lord, oh God, just lift you up tonight, Lord. Your word says if we'll lift you up, Lord, you will draw me into you, Lord. Lord, if we'll head towards you, you'll head towards us. So, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that your presence, oh, Lord, fills our hearts and lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a soul hymn. Let's... Well, some of these days I'm going home where no sorrow ever come. Well, soon be done with troubles and trials.
just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me oh just one word the darkness has to retreat oh just one touch i feel the presence of heaven oh just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can do there's not a mountain that he can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can do no nothing there's nothing that our god can do there's not a prison wall he can't break through oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can do sing just one word just one word broken inside me oh just one word just one word and you revive every dream oh it's just one touch just one touch i feel the power of heaven oh just one touch just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe oh there's nothing that our god can do there's not a mountain that he can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can do there's nothing there's nothing that our god can do there's not a prison wall he can break Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Sing just one word, just one word. You hear what's broken inside me. Oh, just one word, just one word. And you revive every dream. Oh, just one touch, just one touch. Power of heaven. Oh, it's just one touch, just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes so way. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Sing, I will believe. I will believe. For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Oh, I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Oh, praise the name 
Father, calling me out of the dark. And I cannot whisper away what he said in the light. He is my firm foundation, my anchor won't be moved. See, storms may collide, but my soul is on fire with his word. See, when the sun will listen to the sound of He has never lost a battle. So who are you? Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? Jesus defeated the darkness. He has never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. He's never lost a battle. Our great defender, our strong tower. He's never lost a battle. He's never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. He's never lost a battle. Now we'll listen to the sound of power on my lips. For Jesus has broken the curse. He has never lost a battle. Lost a battle. He's never lost. 
feel like God wants to set somebody free from depression tonight. You know, depression's a real thing. Fear's a real thing. Failure can cause us to go to depression. I think of Peter. He blew it. He blew it big time. He could have committed suicide just like Judas did. What made the difference? I believe the difference was this. A little while before that, Peter had a revelation. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So tonight we need to have a revelation of who Jesus is. See him in all his glory. And even though we may have lost a few battles in our life, and maybe we've lost some recently, he's never lost one. He's never lost one. Can we just praise him right now? How the Lord, I speak right now in the name of Jesus. God, those that are fighting depression tonight, Lord, fear has gripped their heart, Lord. Failure, Lord, has it, caused them not to want to even try again. I plead the blood of a lamb tonight. Oh, Lord, I plead your blood in this service right now. Break it, Lord. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As they sing that bridge one more time, if you want to step out in the center aisle or come up front, just make a move. Just make a move by faith and no, no more devil. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm going to go forward in Jesus' name. I'm going to have the joy of the Lord. I, I'm going to have his peace. I'm going to have his power. I'm going to have a future in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Just move somewhere if you're fighting that right now. Oh, let a release come tonight.
never lost a battle. Oh, no. He's never lost a battle. So do I. You are my champion. Giants for when you stand undefeated. Every battle you spiritual realm. Let's take six feet and worship him again right now. Hallelujah. Just begin to worship him all over this building right now. Hallelujah. We're bringing the ark home. Hallelujah. We're bringing, ushering the presence of the Lord into our lives. Oh, Lord, we just worship you right now. Oh, God, on a continual basis, Lord. Let us worship you, Jesus, in spirit and truth. you think about this. If there was $10 million up here at this altar right now, you'd make your way up here and get it. I'm not giving an altar call right now. Forget it. David's wife. The presence of the Lord is coming back to Jerusalem. And she's looking to a window. She didn't go out and fight for revival, didn't fight to have the ark brought back. You would think at least she could be at the outer courts. Saying, thank God somebody fought for it. But she was still in the house. Jesus is coming after a bride that's filled with the Spirit. Are you filled with the Spirit? Oh, Lord, fill us tonight. Fill us tonight. Let it run over, I pray. In Jesus' name. Those are praying, you continue to pray. Ushers, would you come quickly? Just keep on playing, Caleb. Take our Sunday night offering. Remember, church Wednesday night, it starts at 6.30. Jan Sebo needs eight more servers from six, uh, from 11 to 1. Eight servers, from, eight servers from 11 to 1 Saturday. We need you. Lord, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to give tonight. Prepare our hearts even right now for the word. Lord, move in a special way. In Jesus' name. Now, Sister Melissa's coming. Go ahead, guys. Thank you, Jesus. Again, these altars are always open at Victory Worship Center.
worship Him with me. I'm going to praise you with everything in me. Oh, and I'm going to lift you high for all the world to see. Oh, and I'm going to worship in every way that I can. And when I've done it all, I'll just do with me just take six more steps like he said and praise him one more time after you've already done it all just do it all again because he deserves it God deserves your worship I'm gonna worship you every way that I can when I've done it all when I've done it all when I think I've already done it all, I'll do it all again. Hallelujah. I feel the sweet, sweet presence of the Lord in this house. And what the pastor has already said confirms to me what God wants to do in this house tonight. On the way over here, I felt by the Spirit that the Lord said to me, there are, there is, there, someone is, there is discouragement. There is, there is discouragement. There is depression that is being dealt with somewhere in that, in that house. And the pastor got up here, I didn't talk to him, I was rushing in and said those very words. They sang the songs about he's the conqueror already. He's, oh, he's never lost a battle. And I love it so much when God sets up a time of us coming together and he sets it up so specifically by those that are listening for what he's going to say. All the way down to the songs that are sung. God sets it up so he can help someone. Because he loves you that much. And I believe that he is going to help us in this house tonight. I'm going to preach to you a passage of, that I have titled, When the Enemy Laughs Too Soon. When the Enemy Laughs Too Soon. I'll be in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, and it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. 
and had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but they carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captives. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his son and for his daughter. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Verse 9, so David went. He and the 600 men that were with him and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And they found an Egyptian in the field, brought him to David and gave him bread. He did eat. They made him drink water. Verse 15, David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the, of the, unto the evening of the next day. There escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor any thing that they had taken to them, David recovered it all. I want to preach to you tonight, when the enemy starts laughing too soon. You may be seated. God has the capacity to take care of you. He has the resources. He has the magnitude, the authority, the ability. He has the skill and the intelligence to meet all of your needs. And if you understand this concept about God, you also understand that no matter where you find yourself, you know that because of who God is in your life, you don't have to believe in the circumstances that surround you. Simply because of who God is, you don't have to believe in the circumstances. Feelings are not facts. I told you that this morning. Circumstances will produce feelings, but feelings are not facts. Facts. You cannot be controlled by a mood no matter who you are. Don't make other people live captive to a mood that you are in because people who change their circumstances based on an emotion that they are in are very hard to follow. People who live by their emotions, make decisions based on emotions, will be as unstable as water in their walk with God. If I would have allowed my feelings to dictate to me staying in the ministry for the last 18 years, I would have quit a long time ago. Based on my feelings, I would have never lasted. You and I are part of a generation living in a day and an hour where it seems like the enemy that we fight has taken so much away from the people of God. That is why it's encouraging to me to read the story about one of our biblical heroes who recovered everything that the enemy took away from him. It's amazing to me the long list of benefits that can be found in this story. It simply came from one man making a decision to encourage his own self in the Lord. And seeing those benefits makes me ask one question about the story. Why would anyone give up or give in due to a circumstance? The bounce back to that is you don't understand my 
circumstance. You don't understand my battle. But David helps me to understand that something supernatural takes place when you shift your focus toward God and away from the circumstance. Something supernatural will happen in you and for you when you stop looking at what's around you and you start looking at God. We live in a frame of time that if it were not for the ability to look beyond the storm clouds, Pastor, and know in your spirit that the sun is still shining on the other side of those clouds, many would give up the fight. If it were not for knowing that God made promises in his word that are, that are for those that are called by his name regardless of what the devil is doing. If it were not for understanding that the faithfulness of God does not change in spite of changing times, changing seasons, places, people, things, if it were not for the truth, Brother Brandon, that the darkest storm clouds sometimes produce the most beautiful rainbows that you've ever seen. If you did, come on, if you did not have the faith to understand that God and his capacity to take care of you is not diminished by circumstances, then so many more would find themselves walking away from this walk with God, this life with God, saying it's not worth the fight. I cannot tell you how many people have messaged me, contacted me over the last few months, and they use these very words, I'm so tired of fighting. I'm tired of the fight. Why do you think God warned us in his word that there was an enemy that was going to try to wear people out? If there is one truth that we learn about the man David in the word of God, it is this. David survived all the things that he went through because of one thing. And it was because of the heart that he had toward God. That is the greatest asset that you have, your heart. It's something that you have to guard very diligently for out of the issue, out of the heart, your mouth is going to begin to speak. The pressures and the busyness of life leave very little room for anyone else. And sometimes we don't realize what other people need because all we can see is our own needs. What's going on in my little world? But you need to realize that everyone needs encouragement in their lives. Encouragement will put hope back into somebody when life gets tough. But the longer that you walk with the Lord, you will realize that there are times when no one is available to encourage you. You will realize that everyone around you is dealing with their own stuff and they're not really looking to see what you're dealing with. So you walk with the Lord and the longer you go and the stronger you get, it seems like nobody comes along and prays for you. You're supposed to always be praying for other people and nobody's coming along and encouraging you anymore. So you have to learn to encourage yourself. Because life can get tiring. And the Bible says that man that is born of woman has a few days and it's full of trouble. And that is the truth. It doesn't take very long in this world until you are dealing with heartaches, pain, trouble, exhaustion, discouragement, depression. And the list could go on and on. You and I have to come to a point where we realize that you cannot rely on other people's encouragement to keep you walking in victory. As I was preparing this message, the Holy Ghost said something to me that has played over and over in my spirit constantly. He said, pointing your fingers at somebody else because of your lack of victory will never bring you to your victory. Let me say it for you again so you can mull it over in your mind. Pointing your fingers at somebody else because of your lack of victory is never going to bring you to victory. Pointing your fingers at somebody else because of your lack of revival, because of your lack of being full of the Spirit, is never going to bring you to that place that you want to be in. You have to learn to encourage yourself. Everybody can play the blame game and blame somebody else, but not everybody knows how to just encourage yourself in the Lord and go after victory within your own own life. 
David's men began that blame game. They were so overwhelmed by life and by what had happened and what had been stolen and what had been destroyed that the Bible says they were ready to stone David. Can you imagine? David probably even witnessed his own men go over and start picking up the rocks to throw his way. Have you ever had people start throwing proverbial rocks your way? Of course you have because you've lived. But I came to tell you that no weapon can stand in front of a man or a woman who understands the concept of encouraging themselves in the Lord. How did Jesus get through those moments of weariness and discouragement? He encouraged himself by getting away from everything else and talking to his father because there are only literally two options you will give up and lose or you will encourage yourself and win amen melissa you will give up and lose or you will encourage yourself and you will win i can't really see how the options are any different Today, as a child of God, waging a war against an enemy, that's about as plain and simple and basic as I can make it. You either give up and lose or you encourage yourself and win. So how do you encourage yourself, especially when everything is going the opposite of how you want it to go? How do you encourage yourself when you are in one of the most difficult places of your life? Most of the time, encouragement could be equal to life or death. The Bible says, that life and death is in the power of the tongue. It can be equal to giving up or going on. It can be boiled down to winning or losing. So in a world where everyone is focused on themselves, how important is it to understand how to encourage yourself in the Lord? The disposition of our own heart in trying situations will either bring about a new strength or it's going to bring about a further disaster. And you are always going to come to those moments when you have to check your own heart. David had to check his own attitude and his heart in this sudden turn of awful events because he was out there weeping just like the rest of the men. He was distraught over the city being burned. He was shocked over his loved ones being stolen. And then in just a split second, everybody else turns on him as well. And they are ready to blame him for everything that's gone wrong in their life. What do you do when you cannot tell anyone else what you're dealing with? What do you do when nobody's even aware of the fight that you are fighting and you are trying to make it through it? I know it's easier to just sit down and be discouraged, but you will never find a place in God's word where he wanted one of his own to sit down in discouragement. You'll never find it. He found Elijah, his prophet, in the cave, wallowing in discouragement. And I'm sure that the enemy was starting to laugh about the fact that the man of God, who's just called down fire on the mountain and burned up the prophets of Baal, now the enemy's starting to laugh because the man of God has relegated himself to a cave because he's discouraged. And God came to the place of discouragement and called him out of it. He found Jonah sulking underneath a, a, a thing that he made to grow and began to talk to him about his attitude. He found Gideon hiding in the wine press, intimidated and discouraged over the fight that the people were in. And God would not let him stay there, called him out of it. He found Joseph discouraged in the prison, but God always had a way of taking his own to another place if they could hear him how could anyone say that God doesn't care about where you are God isn't in the business of discouraging people along this way called life but the absolute opposite is true I'm encouraged every time I dig into his word I, I'm, I'm encouraged every time I begin 
to seek God. You might need to stop asking the question, where is God? And go after him and encourage yourself in him. I'm encouraged every time I'm in his presence. Is there ever a time that you can tell me that you march yourself down here to this altar and begin to worship God? Is there ever a time that you can say you left that place being in his presence, feeling more discouraged than you did when you came? Is there ever a time that you can say you poured yourself out to God, but you left there feeling worn down? No, you cannot. You know what you have to do. You can't rely on other people to get you to that place of victory. you got to take your two little feet and walk yourself right down to the altar and begin to worship and praise and encourage your own self in the Lord. I'm encouraged every time the anointing of God flows through my life because I know for real that God is with me. I'm encouraged every time I lose myself in worshiping him because the dark storm clouds are going to come. I've had them in my life, but I've looked at them and I said, you know what? Even when I don't see it, he's working. And I look at the dark and I hear the, the, the health reports that try to come at you and say, I'm going to take you out with this or this. And you're not going to be worth anything because I'm going to kill you with this or this. And you stand there and say, even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. He never stops. He never stops working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are you start worshiping him let me just talk to you about that for a minute the Bible says that the enemies of David they and the enemies of the people of Judah took this stuff away that did not belong to them you can never overlook the name Judah when you are digging into the Word of God and reading scriptures because Judah means praise. You cannot let yourself miss the picture that is portrayed of who the enemy is stealing from and what the enemy is trying to steal. I always pay close attention when I see the name Judah, when something was stolen or taken away from Judah because I've come to understand more and more all of the time the power that my praise holds in it it's not just because I can sing it's because I understand that God is waiting for me to worship him because he knows that if I will he will come down and he will live with me and encourage me as I pour myself out on him When I praise him with a pure heart, why wouldn't your enemy want to steal from Judah and make Judah distraught and make Judah, uh, instead of focused, make them be distraught and depressed? Why wouldn't your enemy spend a huge amount of time working to discourage the people of Judah? If Judah's discouraged, Judah won't worship. If Judah doesn't worship, Judah's not strengthened by the presence of God. If Judah's not strengthened, Judah will sit down and weep until there's no strength left in them to go after what rightfully belongs to them. Life brings challenges. Questions, trying times, but if you belong to God, those places are not meant to destroy you. I'd started digging into the Word of God and I found that the name Ziklag where David and his men had been camped is significant. In Hebrew, ziklag means the bringing forth of something that is contained internally. And it's done by either applying constant pressure or by melting it down the way that you melt precious metals. The place where David is camped literally means something that can only be brought out from the inside if enough pressure is applied to it. You don't even know what all is on the inside of you until you've had the greatest pressure of your life applied to you. You don't even know whether you're going to give up or whether you're going to press on until you've had the greatest battle that you've ever had to fight in your life are you camped at ziklag right now and what are you finding that is coming out of you 
Rarely when something is stolen from you in the natural, such as if your home is broken into and things are taken, rarely do you ever hear that everything was, was returned and it's all in good condition and nothing was broken and, and every single thing that was taken from your home was given back to you. In the natural, that just does not happen. But when God in the spiritual sees things that have been taken from you, he doesn't just say that you can have some of it back or bits and pieces of it back. That's what your enemy will tell you. The enemy will tell you that because you did this, you can't have that. But that's not what God says. God's capacity is not limited just because your enemy creeps in to kill, steal, and destroy. God already told us that there was an enemy and he was going to try to steal from you and destroy and kill. That's not a surprise to us. God told us that he was going to take whatever he could from your life. But the magnitude of God's desire looks like this towards you. When the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he's waiting over here with life and that more abundantly, whatever was taken from you is still yours if you didn't give it away. If you didn't Relinquish it. Quit making God out to be something that is not. Just because you live in a world that's cursed by sin. And the enemy of your soul is fighting against you. Sometimes you have to get fed up with something because then you'll get fired up about it. Sometimes you have to get fed up with the way things are. Because then you'll do something about it. David wept until he could not weep anymore, the Bible says. And then, sister, he went after his stuff. The Bible says that when David got the word go from God after he encouraged himself, after everybody's blaming him for what's going wrong, that they came to a place called the Brook Besor. And the only thing that I could find a definition about the word besor is cold. It means a cold place. David and his men had to be willing to go beyond, to go through, to get past a cold place in order to get their stuff back. Uh-huh. You ready? I'm going to that. I'm going there. If you are at a place in your spiritual life and you are using words like I'm cold in my spirit, you feel like you are spiritually at the brook Besor. You feel cold in your spiritual life. You feel like you've got no peace, no joy. You can't pray through. Worship is not high on your list anymore because you feel cold in your spirit. Then I came to tell you that if you want what yours back, if you want it back, you are going to have to put in some effort to get past the brook Besor. It's very plain to see that the brook was not an easy place to get across because the Bible tells me that there are 200 men who were so faint by the time they got to a cold place that they could not go on past the brook Besor. I I thought that when I read that, that they sat down at a brook, it didn't make sense to me because in my mind, a brook is just a small thing. You just step across it and it's not very big for you to have to get across but it was enough of a cold place if Besor means cold then I'm sure David's feet I'm sure David shivered when his feet hit the brook too it doesn't seem like much of a deal but it was big enough for 200 men not to be able to go past it I know it's easy to look at other people when when you are not in the battle and you are not feeling cold It's easy to look at other people and and evaluate how they are handling it. But I cannot point my fingers too quickly at those 200 men. Because I do know that it takes more effort, more effort than normal to move when you are cold. Have you ever eaten something really cold? How many like to eat ice? Are y'all out there? Hello. Hello. How many of you like to eat ice? Thank you. Have you ever 
eaten a whole cup of ice. You crunched on it, you crunched on it, you crunched on it, and then you tried to talk. And your tongue is all frozen up, and it doesn't work right. And you can't move it. You know why? It's cold. You can't do what you would normally do. It takes much more effort to move when you are cold. Encouraging yourself includes going on and worshiping through and praying through and keeping on when you reach that cold place. And cold places don't always mean that you have taken a seat in your walk with God and not doing enough. Sometimes cold places happen. You will come to places in your life, in your walk with God, when the setbacks feel like they keep hitting you in the face, when it seems like the disappointment keeps rolling in, when it feels like life just keeps on bringing you what you did not expect. That's probably why we should never look down our nose at somebody who might be struggling a little bit because you don't know what they might be dealing with or what they're going through. The Bible says David and his men wept until they had no more power to weep. That's some intense crying. That's some overwhelming emotion to have to deal with until you have no power even left on the inside of you to cry anymore. And if David had let that emotion drive his decision, he would have quit right then. And after all of that intense emotion, they still had to go after what had been taken. And they had to go through a cold place because usually after you've cried all that you can cry, and all of your strength has been sapped and you still don't have the answer that you want in your hands, you start to feel like God is far away and you start to face a cold place. Do you think that David had to keep on encouraging himself in the Lord when he saw 200 out of his 600 men sit down? And not be able to go through the cold, you better know it because he was human. I can go ahead and guarantee you that when those 200 men sat down, too worn out to go on, David started saying within himself, Lord, I know you told me to pursue. I know you told me to keep on going and pursue, so I'm going to go through this cold place. And and finally, it was after all of these events... David finally comes to the place where the enemy has his stuff. And he sees the enemy having a party. The Bible says that they were eating, they were drinking, and they were dancing. With all of the stuff, the sole reason for their party was because of what they had taken away from David and the men of Judah. But what that enemy did not know was that he was having a party too soon. He was laughing too soon. And do you know why? It's because there was just one man, one man who knew how to encourage himself in the Lord. The enemy was out there dancing and playing around with Judah's stuff while there was still one man man who knew how to get close to God and listen for the word of the Lord. One man who understood the importance of pressing on past the dissension, pushing on past what you feel, pushing on past the tears and the weeping. The enemy was laughing unaware that there was a man of God who was going to push past his exhaustion. I've heard the laughter of the enemy. A few times with some of my stuff, my joy, my peace, I've heard it. The enemy started his celebration party without realizing that there was one man who was going to deal with that cold place, but it was not going to stop him. And because that one man was able to keep on worshiping past the weeping, and because that one man was able to keep on uh, pressing on past the shivering, he got everything back that the enemy had taken from him. But he's not the only one that got everything back 
back. The 400 men with him were not the only ones who got their victory back. But because one man encouraged himself in the Lord, the Bible says David was able to go back to the 200 who were stuck at the cold place and give them their victory too. How important is it that you encourage yourself in the Lord? I remember whenever I was first starting out in the ministry, I, I've probably told some of you this story. You've heard me reference it. I remember going, giving up everything, going on the mission field. I remember surrendering all of my dreams to the Lord. Everything that I wanted to be looked like it was not going to happen. And I went to India as a 20-year-old kid. Not knowing what, I, I laid down everything, terrified, but I went. Co uh, feeling the pressure, but I went. And I, I began to grow. I began to see things happen. The first two or three years, I began to see miraculous things happen. Unbelievable miracles that I've heard about, read about. Now I'm the one seeing these things happen, Brandon. And God is moving, and I'm thinking, yes, God is taking me on this trajectory that he's got me on. It's very exciting. Everything's going right. But then... The enemy saw a, a, an open door to come in and start stealing. And because I was associated with someone who asked a question about the finances for the ministry that I was working with, I had nothing to do with it. But because I was associated, I was just one of David's 400 men. But I had to fight the battle too. Because I was associated with the one who asked the question, I was told that I could never come back to the nation of India again. I was told that the ministry that I was working with wanted nothing left to do with me. Get out. We don't want you anymore. We're done with you. I had been building an orphanage, raising money, laying bricks, buying sand. I'd named the orphanage, writing songs, God using it, orphans coming, teaching Bible school students, miracles happening, and all of a sudden, you cannot come back here anymore we don't want you. And everything slammed in my face. You talk about weeping until there is no more power to weep. I cried. People would look at me and ask me if I was physically ill because I looked like it in my countenance. My, I wasn't physically ill, but my heart was completely sick over the fact that the enemy had tried to steal my calling away from me, steal my mission field, steal the work that I had done for God away from me. And I was very, very discouraged very depressed and I said God if this is what I get for serving you and laying all my dreams down I don't want it I'm done I was at a very very cold place I'm not just preaching to you some good scripture to try to make you have a good Sunday night service I've lived this I was at a very, very, very cold place in my walk with God. Can't understand. I'm out here fighting for you just like David was, and now all of my stuff is stolen. Everything's taken. So I decided I would go to a camp meeting with some people that I knew at their church in Texas. And I went to the camp meeting thinking this is my last, I'm, I'm going to go on into the pharmaceutical field. I've got a degree. I earned it before I went on the mission field. That's what I'll do. I'm done with this, God. I'm not doing it. Cold. I went to that camp meeting, and the preacher, I can't tell you what he preached. I don't know what he preached. But I do know that I went up to that altar that night. I went up to where the place of Judah gets their stuff back. I went up there. And I raised my hands, and I stood there thinking, I don't even know what to do next. I've been so broken and so discouraged and so depressed over this. And the man of God 
walked by and he did not give me some prophetic, here's your destiny, here's your sign. He didn't give me some great word that I needed to hear. All he said when he walked by was he laid his big old hand that covered my entire head and he said eight times in about machine gun fashion, he said, don't quit. Don't quit, Melissa. Don't quit. Don't don't quit. Don't quit. He didn't know what I was going through. He did not know what I was fighting, what had happened. But God sent somebody by to say, encourage yourself in the Lord and don't quit. Don't. And I left that meeting and I said, okay, God, if you don't want me to quit, I won't quit, but I don't know what to do. And I went home. We began to pray. The next day, somebody called from Kentucky and said, come to a missions conference. We went there there. At that missions conference, every door opened back up to me. It was more than India. It was India, China, Nepal, Australia. More doors opened up in front of me than what had been slammed in my face. You know why? Because I learned to encourage myself in the Lord, and I heard God when he said, don't you stop at that cold place. And I can stand here with you tonight and say, I know how to help you get across that cold place. I know how to grab you by the hand and say, let me help you to your victory. I know how to do it because God's done it for me. Would you stand with me tonight? The Word of God paints incredible pictures for us to see. I know that the Holy Ghost said to me, there is discouragement that is trying to work on some of you. It's working on you. Working against you. And it's causing you to go into somewhat of a cold place in your spirit. But do you see how important it is that you do not sit down or give up no matter where? If you feel like you're the greatest or you feel like you're the least, you cannot sit down and give up in this thing. How vital it is that seeking God and doing what God told you to do, even when it feels cold. We sing songs like this. Well, I went to the enemy's gate and I I took back what he stole from me. Took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. Well, I went to the enemy's camp whoever wrote that song must have read David's story and I took back what he stole from me he's under my feet he's under my feet he's under my feet he's under my feet Satan is under my my feet You may feel like the enemy is dancing and having a party with some of your stuff. Some of your kids, some of your victory. You feel like you can hear the laughter of the enemy in your ears. I came by to tell you tonight that he is dancing too soon. He's laughing too soon. If you will grab a hold of this word that I'm telling you tonight, David had already cried until he couldn't cry anymore. But the Bible says that when he came upon the enemy and saw him, he took back everything that had been stolen from him. Did you hear me? I said everything. Everything was given back to him because he knew how to go on. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me I took back what he stole from me took back what he stole from me well I went to the enemy's camp and I I took back what he stole from me he's under my feet He's under my feet. He's under my feet. He's 
under my feet. Satan is under my feet. There's somebody that wants to come up to this front and say, Sister, there's been some discouragement working on my mind. There's been some discouragement working against me. I know some of you already came earlier, but that wasn't all of you. There's some discouragement that's working against me, and I'm, hey, come on, and I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. Come on, sister. If it's just for you, then it's just for you. Hallelujah. Discouragement tries to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Some of you in this room, if you would be real honest, you would say, sister, I'm, I feel cold in my spirit. I feel like I'm at a cold place. I do not feel like I'm burning with the fire of the Holy Ghost. I feel like I'm in a cold place and I'm having to press my way through it to get to the other side. But do you know what you can sing after you go to the enemy's camp and you stomp all over his head with your feet? You can say, look what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Because each day he's just the same. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, you're still coming. Well, I went to the enemy's cave. And I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I took back. What he stole from me, well, I went to the enemy's gate, and I took back what he stole from me. Well, he's under my feet, he's under my feet. I said, He's under my feet, he's under my oh, he's under my feet, he's under my feet. I said, He's under my feet, he's under my feet. I said, He's under my feet. He's under my feet, oh, he's under my feet, he's under my feet, Satan is under my feet. Oh, well, I went to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me, oh, took back what he stole from me, oh, yes, I took back what he stole from me, well, I went to the enemy's camp. And I took back what he stole from me. Well, he's under my feet. Come on, he's under my feet. Oh, he's under my feet. He's under my feet. Oh, he's under my feet. He's under my feet. I said he's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Well, look what the Lord has done. Why don't you look what? The Lord has done. Hey, he healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Come on and praise him. Oh, each day he's just the same. Oh, I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Come on and take your victory. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, he healed my body. He touched my mind. Oh, he saved me just in time. And I'm going to praise his name. Come on and praise him. He day he's just the same. Oh, come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, well, I went to the enemy's head and I took back what he stole from me oh yes I took back what he stole from me oh, oh yes, I took back, back what he stole from me well I went to the enemy's head and I took back what he stole from me well he's under my feet he's 
Grace for my sadness as I remember his name. Morning into dancing, sorrow into joy. Every day will be sweeter than the day before. God said he would turn it around. My God said he would turn it around. What the devil meant for evil, God will make it good. Turn around, turn around. For the next, I want you to keep playing. For the next three or four minutes, I want you to encourage yourself in the Lord. If he leads you to pray with somebody, do that. But we got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Let's begin to prophesy over our situations right now. Begin to open your mouth. Walk around the building, whatever you want to do. But begin to encourage yourself in the Lord right now. God is for you tonight. There's victory for you tonight. There's power for you tonight. There's healing for you tonight. Begin to encourage yourself in the Lord. Begin to speak what the Word of God says right now. Oh, give him all the praise. 
days. God is in control. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Oh, just give him all the praise. God is in control. Oh, give him all the praise. God is in control. Just give him all the praise. God is in control. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Thank you, Jesus. What a word. What a word. Let's just praise him just one more time. Lord, we just praise you. We thank you. We exalt you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me talk to you one minute. Wednesday night we start church at 630. Tell somebody, come. We need you. 
Let's have revival. Let's bring back the presence of the Lord to the house like never before. We've always had the presence of the Lord, but we can go to another level in Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Jan needs eight more people to help serve Saturday. What, what is going on Saturday? Saturday is a time of fellowship among us. We're thanking God for His blessing and wanting to be a blessing to other people. So we encourage you to come eat with us. Just talk to people. Maybe you know somebody in your area that doesn't get a hot meal. Bring them or tell them about it. Just share the meal with them. Let them see the love of Jesus in you. We're going to give away clothes and stuff. We're going to just, just shine for Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, kids uh, in the area that don't have money, they can get free haircuts. We've got a couple ladies going to do that. And we're going to have some blow-ups outside for them to play. It'll be chilly, but let me tell you something. If there's a blow-up outside and it's 40 degrees, the kid's going to play. Amen. So uh, we'll just have a good time fellowshipping, eating, giving away groceries. And let me tell you something. We didn't take up a special offering for this, but you can give to it if you want to. But I don't believe in just badgering people. God has blessed this church, so we're going to bless this community. But Brother Faust, we still got a lot of debt. Let me tell you something. The debt is disappearing. We still got a lot of it, but it's disappearing. Somebody praise the Lord with me that the debt is going down, down, down. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. The Lord is good. Amen. Give Sister Melissa a hand for. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. It scares me to death to have some people come preach. I'll be honest with you, it does. I don't know what they're going to do. It scares me zero for that lady to get the microphone. Because I know she loves God and she's heard from God. And that's a blessing. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your people. Go with us and bring us back to the point of time. In Jesus' name, amen. Get you a shoebox on the way out.